Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. It's holiday week. And, uh, man, I've got so much to be thankful for, especially you, the Word Balloon listeners. Uh, great feedback. Uh, 2019 has really been an incredible year, and I have you to thank for it. Questions or comments about the show, reach me via email, john at wordballoon.com. I keep getting great email from listeners. Thank you very much for the encouragement and the support. Uh, follow me on Twitter under John Word Balloon. Follow me on Facebook under my name, John Suntress, and also the Word Balloon Network. And, uh, of course, I've got my uh, YouTube channel. Lots of videos up there. More coming uh, right under Word Balloon. Check it out. And uh, it's going to be a whole week of uh, fantastic episodes of uh, new conversations and classic old conversations. Great feedback about the old stuff as well. I thank you. Thank you for listening to all the commercials. Uh, I've got one more uh, commercial before the show starts, and uh, then we'll get underway. But as always, I thank you for your attention and the support. Thanks very much. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntra is here. Man, I'm happy to welcome Charles Soul back to Word Balloon. He's got a lot of cool stuff going on right now, a lot of Star Wars stuff going on right now. He will be uh, doing a Kylo Ren miniseries that uh, fills in uh, Kylo's backstory, the adventures of Ben Solo, and how he transitioned from being Ben to Kylo. He's also going to be taking over the regular Star Wars book with a new issue number one after 75 issues. And Charles is involved with Project Luminous. We've all heard rumors about Project Luminous for the last couple months. What could it involve? It's going to be something that's going to hit a lot of different uh, literature platforms, including comics. And uh, Charles is the comic connection for Project Luminous. Uh, he tells us about his second uh, trip to the Skywalker Ranch and uh, some behind-the-scenes stuff about Project Luminous. That'll be very interesting. Uh, pretty cool, man. Plus, Charles has a brand-new novel that is out on December 3rd. It's called Anyone. Uh, it's his follow-up to the Oracle year. It's another interesting uh, sci-fi uh, story that uh, Charles describes very coolly. And uh, I'm psyched for him, man. I'm, I'm really happy that Charles is uh, doing so well. Uh, the former lawyer is uh, now writing full-time. And uh, we get the benefits from enjoying his comics and novels. Charles Soule on today's Word Balloon. All brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you greatly, League, for your support via Patreon. Patreon.com slash Word Balloon. That's where you can go if you want to subscribe to Word Balloon. Word Balloon is free. It will always be free. But if you want to help out the cause, that's where you go. Patreon.com slash Word Balloon. Thank you greatly for your support, League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon is also brought to you by Aftershock Comics. Aftershock is going to have a hell of a December because they've got a roster of uh, great writers and artists that can't be beat, man. I'm talking about people like uh, Juan Doe and uh, Garth Ennis and Marguerite Bennett. And uh, we just talked to Matthew Clickstein earlier today. If you haven't heard that uh, interview, uh, You Are Obsolete is a really cool horror comic that uh, is a kind of Children of the Corn, Village of the Dam spin with a 21st century look and incorporating uh, social media and social media savvy kids that seem to have this small European town under their control. It's even got a little bit of Logan's run in there too as far as uh, killing off the adults when they hit 40. Uh, really interesting stuff. Uh, there are three issues in. The fourth issue comes out in December. You should definitely check it out. Uh, but uh, that's just a couple of the great books. The Last Space Race, I enjoyed that book greatly. Uh, Horde from uh, Marguerite Bennett and, of course, Animosity. Donnie Cates' Baby Teeth, all of Garth Ennis' great stuff. My buddy Tim Seeley has Dark Red over there as well. My buddy Phil Hester and Ryan Kelly have Stronghold over there at Aftershock. Really, really interesting stuff that is deserving of your attention. Aftershock Comics, check them out. You'll go to their website. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on how to order these books through your local shop at AftershockComics.com. All right, let's get into it now with uh, Charles Soul. Glad to welcome him back. And a uh, great new conversation here on Word Balloon about his uh, new novel, Anyone, and a lot of Star Wars information from Charles as well. Great uh, 2020 lining up for Charles uh, in the uh, months ahead. And uh, I'm glad that he's here to preview it all. A great discussion with Charles Soule on today's Word Balloon. Charles Soule, welcome back to Word Balloon. Uh, as we were just saying off the air, we just saw each other face-to-face -face at Rose City and uh, got to hang out and break bread. Good to see you, man. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, Portland is, is, is a hell of a town. I've only been a few times, but I've, I've enjoyed it a lot every time I've gone. Obviously, there's tons of comics creators there, um, lots of comics companies there, uh, both Image and... Um, 
uh, and uh, Oni Press are there, and, and there's just you know lots. I mean, Bendis is there. Your good friend Brian Bendis is there, and, and <laughs> lots of great creators. The Fractions, I think, Fraction to Connors. Oh are yeah, there. oh yeah. Rucka and uh, and Jed Van Meter and uh, Jeff Parker's there, and uh, Matt Wagner, of course, is there for a long time. Diana Schutz. Uh, uh, Chris Sabella is there. Christopher Chris, Sabella. Absolutely, I saw Chris and Ibrahim Mustafa and. Uh, God, I mean, uh, you know, Bob Shrek uh, lives out there. I didn't see, I didn't see Wagner or Shrek, um, and I was bummed about that. I did see Diana. It was great to see Diana. And yeah, honestly, man, I mean, if if I could pick up and live anywhere, I would absolutely live in Portland because uh, I could literally count, you know, a dozen or more friends out there, and that's that's why I was really looking for Steve Lieber. I got to have, went to Heliascope and uh, hung out for an afternoon with uh, Lieber and Parker over there. Oh, that's great! And yeah, Paul, Paul, and uh, Colin, Colin Coover and uh, and Paul are over there too. Tobin. Yeah, gosh, I, it, it is funny when you start listing it off. Like, I mean, it's it's really it's Portland. It's uh, Toronto has a lot of people. Yes. And Bro- Brooklyn has a lot of people. Yes. Other, other than that, I mean, I guess there's the L.A. has its share, but really, I think it's 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 Portland, Toronto, and Brooklyn seem to be the places. Yeah, and you know, I'll I'll say, and I'm glad to, to live here. Chicago has a nice community as well. Oh, you're right. You're right. Absolutely. You know? Yep, like Lee Norton, uh, yeah, Brian Brown's out there. Yeah, there's that's true. That's Joe Thompson, point. yeah, man. No, Alex Ross, yeah. So you know, it's funny. But uh, no, man. But again, no, you're in New York, and and yeah, we hung out, and uh, Matthew Rosenberg uh, joined us for dinner and everything, and uh, yeah. we had a blast. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Your brother, it was a, it was yeah. a good good hang time, man. A lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. It's always like you know. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you're if you're like me, but I I don't always get out to. Um, you know, like I'm social, sure, whatever, but but conventions have a way. Like, you know, I'm not trying to say I have no friends, but conventions have a way of of you know pushing you into these social situations that that are a little harder to engineer. And sometimes when you're home, it's like, well, you know, I have work to do, I have ready sure. to stay home. But if you're at a convention and and you know everybody's sort of accessible and you can go out and it's a great time. And um, I really like it for that. And I think at, at this point, you know, I, I love meeting fans. Um, and I love sort of seeing new places, but the the social element of the conventions is seeing the people who, you know, you can have conven- you can have the kind of conversations with comic people that you, you can't always have with people in your in sort of your your day to day friend circle. So it's oh, just yeah. it's, always, it's always great. Yeah, man, and and I always I always say when I go to places like San Diego and Portland, and certainly qualified this time too. It's like it's really expensive summer camp because we're, we're there, the weather's nice, and it's like hey, it's all my out of town friends, we're all together. Let's let's yep. hang out. Let's have a meal. Let's go. Let's go do some after hour stuff. And yeah, it's always always a good time. And uh, I'm, I I get no sleep, but I'm always smiling. So it's worth it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Too yeah. much, man. Well, you got a lot on your plate lately, man. And uh, we got a lot to talk about here. Um, do you want to start with your uh, your new novel? Anyone? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. That's that's um <clears throat> that's imminent. That so today we're recording. I don't know when this is going to go live, but we're recording this on November 25th, just before Thanksgiving. And right. Um, the book is released on December 3rd. It oh, is, great, because so, my plan was to put this on Friday so everyone can look forward to it next week. Uh, that's fantastic. I, that's, I appreciate it. So, sure. so um, the, uh, the novel is called Anyone. Uh, it's my second novel. Uh, the first novel was The Oracle Year, which I'm pretty yes. sure we talked about. Absolutely uh, we did. And, and that came out in April of 2018. And so, it's, so my second one's coming out, you know, December 2019. So about a year and a half, an 18 month window, which is, which is kind of what I want to do. If, if things continue to go as I hope, I'll have a novel out every 18 months or so. That's great, man. So what's, <clears throat> what's this one about? Well, this one is about, I'm a big fan of writing stories that have this really high concept hook. Um, so, you know, what if this happened in the world? And then, and then you play out the scenario to the, to the farthest possible spot. You know, you think of every ramification of that what if thing happening and then you try to integrate it into kind of a real world setting. How the world would actually be if that thing happened. And so um uh I had a like I had I had a series called Letter forty four a while ago that had oh, that yeah. kind of, it, was, it was about a, a president who on his first day in office finds out aliens are real basically. It's like <laughs> that you know? and it so, was great, absolutely man. And so, so you take that concept and you spin it out through politics and economics and all those things. And then my first novel, The Oracle Year, was about what if there was a guy who actually could tell the future? There was an actual prophet who popped up in the world. Yep. Like, what would that do? And so the new book, Anyone, is the same kind of thing. It's about what if a technology was invented that would let you put your mind in anyone else's body? Um, and, and how would that change things? And it, and it, it goes from the moment that technology is invented 
to a period about 25 years in the future after that tech has become ubiquitous. It's like smartphones. Everybody uses it all the time. For sh- short little hops, long hops, commuting around the world for trips, for travel, for, for you know, um, gosh, all kinds of things. Soldiers will, will, will zap into kind of local bodies that they can use until they get killed and then they'll flash back. There's, there's just a million different things that, that happen with it. Um, people rent out their bodies, people use other bodies. It's all, it's a whole thing. And so what I wanted to do is, was to write a book about, I mean, really what the book is about is the fact that right now in the world, we have such a hard time seeing through other people's eyes, you know, seeing, seeing other people's perspectives, if they're even a little bit different than ours. And, um, you know, you look at politics, you look at pop culture, you look at just any, any number of things. It's just really like, we all have our little tribes and, and if you're not in my tribe, then I, you're kind of the enemy, right? And I know you're a sports guy, right? And so you must see that all the time with the sports teams. And like, <laughs> it's, it, you know, but, but, and it's, sports are fine. Entertainment is fine. You know, DC versus Marvel, all that's fine. But when it starts getting into like serious ideological issues that, that are, you know, affecting the planet and affecting the world and affecting the future, like I just, I wish we could get a little bit, a little bit more aligned in terms of the way we, or at least more open to other people's points. Oh my God, yes. Jesus. You know? uh, yeah, we're at a very divided uh, time right now. Absolutely. You got it. You got it. So, so the idea of the book or the idea that technology sort of is, is, you know, if you could, if you could, if you could get yourself in somebody else's body and sort of see the world through their eyes, um, or if, if, you know, somebody walking up to you and talking to you, you had no idea who that person originally was, right? Like you, you didn't, you don't know if they're young, old, what race they are, what gender they're, any of those things. You have to take them at face value and, and judge them by what they do, not how they look in a way. Right. And so I was just thinking, so, so, so the, the book plays with ideas about that, but it also plays with the idea that technology gets misused, right? Technology, um, like Facebook is a great example, the way Facebook was either was manipulated or manipulated us. You know, it depends on who you ask. But, but the idea that technology is something that, that has a life of its own and can be used for all sorts of things and is not necessarily benign is very much a part of the book too. So it's, so it's all those ideas kind of stuffed together, um, in a really kind of fast paced thrillery package. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, the advanced reviews have been fantastic. It's already started making some lists and all that stuff. And I'm hey, excellent. Yeah. I mean, I'm excited for it. It's writing novels is, is a really different thing than comics. And, um, it's a career I'd love to keep going for a long time, but, uh, you know, it's, it's just like movies, right? You're only as good as your last book, so so we'll, well see. Well, and how did the last book do? I mean, what what kind of connection have, have you noticed at the cons, the comic cons, that uh, you know your comic readers are following you to your novel? Yeah, I have, which has been great. Uh, I sign a lot. People bring the book to the great. show, which is which is great because you figure you know bringing a comic is one thing. It's it's you know weighs almost nothing. It's really thin, but bringing a novel, <laughs> is like, you know, you got to stuff that thing in your bag. It's a commitment, so, absolutely. So that's great. So people read the book, you know, but, but I hear a lot about on social media, you know, and there's all these like novels are, there's all these ways people kind of rate them and track them online. And, you know, there's things like Goodreads and Amazon reviews yes. and all this stuff. Yes. And, and, you know, it, it, it just seems like it touched people, right? The Oracle year worked, you know, it, the sales were really strong. Um, it was really steady. Like people found it for a long time. It wasn't just the first week and then it was gone. Like people were reading, buying that book for a really long time at a high level. And so I felt like I really established a base of people who are excited to see what my next book is going to be. And, and so far, the advanced response, I mean, the proof's in the pudding, as always, right? It's going to be what happens on December 3rd, and then January 3rd and February 3rd, and all, you know, moving <laughs> forward when people are actually buying it. Sure. But so far, you know, all of the indicators are that I wrote a book people like. So, you know, fingers crossed, because I love doing it, and I'd like to keep doing more. No, that's terrific, man. And, uh, you know, I, I think of yourself and uh, Alex Segura, another another comic writer that, uh, yep. you know, is obviously having some good novel success and everything. And, I, and I'm really glad. And, I'm, uh, you know, I mean, and then, of course, we've got our established uh, authors like Rucka and Meltzer and yeah. people like that. Um, no, that's that's terrific. Do you ever see yourself, is there a, uh, a concept that would involve recurring characters, that kind of series of novels, or do you want to do... Uh, you know, individual novels. Standalones. Yeah, you know, it's funny because um, I just had a conversation about that um, this weekend. And I I think, so So I'm working on my third novel now. It's actually just out to the publisher now, and hopefully they like what I've sent them, and, and they'll, be, they'll, like, acquire it, and then I'll write the rest. Like, the, you know, you, when, you, when you send a book out, um, you send kind of a, a, a chunk of it, like a, whatever you have done, and then a, a pretty detailed description of what the rest of the book's going to be. Mm-hmm. So that's what they're reviewing. Um, and that's another standalone. It's another one of these what ifs. What okay. if this happened? Um, but then after that, I mean, 
I grew up on, on like fantasy and science fiction series, like these long running things that had 20 installments or seven installments. Sure. Or even just, you know, I think a lot of us did. And so, um, and I also know that if you get something that hits, whether it's the Jack Reacher books or, or you know, the uh, Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones books, sure. or just, you know, any number of things, you, you're kind of set. You just keep, you know, you find a formula that works and you keep writing it and you, and you, you, you know, if it's flexible, you can find new things that interest you within that formula, you know, whatever. But, um, at this point, I don't really have that concept. Okay. Uh, so I would do it and I'm excited to do it, but I put in, I, you know, I have to turn out ideas all the time because I'm always working on, you know, comics or books or different sure. stuff. So, so I haven't really had any headspace to sit down and think, you know, what would be my trilogy or what would be my recurring characters thing. But, um, it's appealing. You know, if I can think of somebody that would be interesting to write about for five, six, three, four, ten 10 books, I would, I'd do it. Are you still Matt Murdock during the day? Or are you still doing your law practice? Uh, no, I, I really, I mean, every once in a while I'll put the lawyer hat back on. Okay. I was going to say that. You put know, me to shame in terms of your productivity. I was going to say, you're maintaining the law career as well, but that's, that's cool. Both, I'm, I'm glad that the creative side is going so well for you that you are able to put the practice down. So yeah, right yeah. Now. It's also, you know, I'll tell you what, John, it was also just a question of like, of, of responsibility, you know, like the, when you're, when you're practicing law, you cannot do it at a half-ass level. Right. You, yeah. Particularly, you know, I was doing immigration work. And so if you screw up an immigration case, somebody's life is, is at best hugely altered or hugely inconvenienced. Well, and of course, worst, yeah. it could be ruined, yeah. you know, so you can't take that. You can't do that at anything less than a, than a thousand percent level. And when it became pretty clear that I was I was putting it second place for myself beside the writing, that it, it was irresponsible to do it. It was not fair to the clients, and it, it you know it was like I took oaths, you know. So like I uh, I just I just finished the clients I had and and worked on them as as you know and made sure they were all squared away, and then I stopped taking any new ones. And so over time, that you know if that's what you're doing, then then you don't have to worry about being a lawyer anymore. So every once in a while, like. You know, like I, I uh, like every time I, I do a new comic, I, I form a new like business entity and bank account and legal documents for it. Um, so kind of it's in, it's in its own bucket. And oh, um, okay, so I'll so I'll be a lawyer then. You know, negotiate contracts. Well, whatever. Sure. But but basically, um, I'm done. I'm a full time novelist and comic writer and screenwriter and all that stuff. That's my job. Well, that's good, man. Because again, you're doing it well, and uh, and I'm glad the audience is responding. And uh, you're, you're getting great opportunities. Now, before we get into uh, some of the stuff that's happening in uh, the Marvel and uh, Star Wars world, I, I, I know that you and uh, Snyder have a new image yep. book, Undiscovered Country, and there's another what if, uh, a far, our far from dystopian future what if. Uh, tell, talk about that for a minute. Yeah, so Undiscovered Country, man, that book uh, is very exciting for both Scott Snyder and myself. Um, we're working with Giuseppe Camicoli on the art. <laughs> Um, he did uh, he did the Darth Vader run with me for more. Yes, yes, yeah. no, great artist, absolutely, man. Yeah. And he's just he's just amazing. So so basically, Scott and I have been friends for a long time, long time, um, and we we just wanted to do a book together for a while, and we were kicking around ideas, and and as our both of our careers grew, it just seemed like it would need to be an idea that would that would warrant both of us working together for a long time on it. We wanted it to be something big and something that would inspire us both, and so the idea we came up with. Uh, was for this book, Undiscovered Country. And the premise is that a few years from now, the United States seals its borders um, in a very, yeah, I know, you know, ripped from the headlines, right? But Exactly, it's, but no, it's, again, a, not, a, not a far-flung idea, certainly more than ever, given yeah. uh, the current uh, social uh, agenda. Absolutely. So, so the idea here is that it's more than just like, you know, let's build a wall between the United States and Mexico. This is like every border, <laughs> north, south, east, west. Oh, yeah. Coasts, everything gets sealed um, with these these huge huge walls go up, um, and then uh, there's like you know sort of electromagnetic shielding over it so satellites can't see in, okay. and like an air wall kind of force wall so you can't fly over it. All this stuff, um, so it truly is sealed. It becomes a black box, and the U.S. doesn't explain why it's doing it. It just it just happens one day. If you're outside the United States on that day, you stay out, no matter what your citizenship is. So there are Americans trapped outside. There are foreigners okay. trapped outside, whatever. Um, and and it stays that way for 30 years. And <laughs> yeah, no one knows anything about what happens. The world moves on. It it kind of does its does what it needs. You know what it's going to do. And then 
um, uh, uh, a huge pandemic starts to rage in the outer world, like this this horrible disease called the sky virus. And, and people are dying and dying and dying and they can't find a cure. And then this message comes out. The first message from the United States in 30 years. And it says, hey, we actually have a cure for this. Um, if you send in a team uh, to negotiate with us, then we will consider releasing it to you and maybe even open our borders depending on how things go. So, so this expedition is put together, um, seven people, kind of as directed by this message from the United States. They, they, they are given a path to fly in over the wall. They fly in, they're immediately shot down, and they land in a United States that is radically different from what they're led to believe. It's like, <laughs> and I don't want to spoil too much because sure. part of the fun is seeing what's inside, but like they expected like this advanced society that was finding cures to diseases and stuff like that, and they find something massively, massively different. And, and then they have to figure out what the hell's going on and figure out if there is a cure, if there, you know, what, what the point of all this was. And so the story follows this group as they journey through the United States, um, seeing all the different zones and regions. Because it, what's, without spoiling anything, the U.S. has been divided into all of the, many, many, many different regions. Um, think of them as like you know states, but they're usually more like three or four states kind of stuck together. Okay. And each one of those zones has its own sort of vibe or genre feel. Um, and, and there's a reason for that. So like the, the first zone is sort of apocalyptic almost. Okay. And then, then they, there's a sci-fi zone that's very much like kind of a, a horror movie set in an Apple store, um, and that's in the Pacific Northwest. Um, okay. And then and then there's one where the Ice Age seems to have been to have been brought back, and that has like saber tooth tigers and mammoths and, and like you know Neanderthals and stuff like that. And it's it, it's it's all of these different United States kind of stuffed together into into what was the United States. Uh, and, and again, there's a reason for all of that happening, but this, the, the expedition certainly doesn't know, and the readers won't know it for a while, but we're going to be laying down clues. It's a big mystery. It's like lost or land of the lost or something like that. And, and it's called undiscovered country. And we're, we're just, it's so much fun. Like if I hope that, I mean, like writing it is just a blast. You get to do whatever you want. You get to play with American iconography in these really interesting ways. Um, because, you know, one of the things that we happen on when we were developing, it was the idea that. You know when you're watching like a superhero movie and there's a cameo, like you're watching a Thor movie and then Captain America pops up in it. Sure, sure. Oh, that's awesome. Or, or an X-Men movie and there's Wolverine and like that, or even in a comic, right? Like if there's a cameo from Spider-Man, you know, what, like that's exciting and you know what it means when Spider-Man shows up because Spider-Man represents something. Sure. And so what we realize is that the exact same thing is true of American iconography. So if, if you show someone, say, the space shuttle, if you show someone the Statue of Liberty, which is kind of an obvious one, but if you show them like Disney World, if you show them the Grand Canyon, if you show them Mount Rushmore, if you show them the Mississippi River, like all of these things have meaning to Americans because, and even people overseas because of pop culture, but certainly to Americans. They're things that we have been seeing and, and, and know the history of and just like they, they have an immediate impact. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you can use those things very much the same way as you would use Wolverine popping up on a comic. Like if you show, um, Again, like at the space shuttle, but it's repurposed in some other interesting way. It can be really, it can be really impactful. So we're oh, we're just like, it. you know, it's it's been really fun to think of those things. Uh, and and the first issue's out so far, and it launched really high. It was cool. the, uh, the 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 highest image launch in five years, and the second highest in ten years. Oh, that's great, man. Well, sure. I mean, again, you and Snyder, again, you have a you guys have a great bibliography, and I think have built a level of uh, trust as far as readers go and stuff. So that's I'm glad to see that. And again, I know, you know, Scott has certainly had his image books and you as well with things, you know, that I don't know how many image books you've had other than, like, curse words, but I know that, uh, you know, Letter 44 was the Roni and everything. And, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, so, yeah, you, you both have, you know, already, I think, established yourselves both as creator-owned guys and also mainstream guys. So that's great. And as far as the iconography of America and stuff, I mean, let's not forget the classic Planet of the Apes with, like you said, the Statue of Liberty washed up on shore. I mean, I also, that NBC show that I was sorry, it didn't, to me, live up to the premise. But I uh, going back to San Diego, I think of uh, when they were teasing it, Timeless. And, oh, yeah. And it was 25 years in the future, and you went to, of all places, as far as the Chicago guy goes, Wrigley Field. And, yep. you know, it's known for the, the wall of vines and everything on, on the outfield wall. But now, because it was so far in the future, the whole park was just covered with in vines and stuff like that. And it was like, oh, my God, what the hell happened? So, yep. yeah, I can appreciate that. And that's 
No, I think that's terrific because, yeah, it's familiar familiar uh, items and stuff, but again, in the future and in this dystopian whatever the hell happened and stuff, yeah, who's, who's to say, you know? I mean, what are you saying Abraham Lincoln's image for or some other, uh, you know, iconograph, uh, uh, iconic, uh, you know, president or uh, historic person or whatever? Yeah, you know, you, you name it. There's there's It's like literally endless. Like one of the things we're playing with is, um, you know, like the bison in Buffalo, right? Like they, they Okay, were- sure. You know, or like a bald eagle, right? Like that's got sure. So you can play with that. Or just, you know, there's so, there are so, everywhere you look, there's different things and there's regional things, right? So, and there's cities, you know, the feel of San Francisco is very specific and it's different than say the feel of Seattle or Portland. 100%. They, you know, they all, they all have a quality to them and you can use that and it's powerful. And so we have all of the power of American history and American pop culture and all of those things are kind of working for us. And honestly, our job is kind of to try to tell a story that isn't just, oh, remember when you saw, you know, remember Davy Crockett and his coonskin cap? Like, that's not interesting. Like, we want to do something (laughs) that uses this stuff in a way that's like, you know, that's impactful. Are they, is it the seven people that that descend, are they a multinational Mm -hmm. group? And I mean, and that's, I imagine that's obviously part of your mythology and I want people to read it and stuff, but... You know, the UN was obviously based here in, in you know, or is based here in, in the United States and stuff. So, is it the European Union that's that's trying to make this deal, or some other well, what, world what's organization? In the, in the intervening thirty years, there's been because there's a power vacuum, right? And so, sure. the United States, all of those, like you know, it, it, it withdrew its military before the um, before the ceiling, we call it the ceiling of the United okay. States, LNG. So, but so all of those military bases and all that stuff were just like abandoned, and so the um, the way that the the world reacted to that was by kind of going crazy because all of these checks and balances were no longer there. And so you ended up with World War III, World War IV, um, and they they caused a lot of havoc. A lot of bad things happened. And But when things eventually settled down, you ended up with two primary empires and then a bunch of kind of, you know, rogue states or outer zone states. Um, so the two, the two main empire, empires are the uh, Alliance uh, Euro Afrique, which is basically Europe and Northern Africa and the Middle East, okay, with with satellite territories here and there around, um, and then the other one is the Pan Asian Prosperity Zone, which is basically China, and then the Malay Peninsula, Peninsula, India, um, Japan, and much of Oceania, and, and they also have South America, which is cool, oh, because China has a lot of vendors in South South America now as it is, so. So that's kind of the way it works, um, and then there are there are like outliers here and there, like sure, um, you know, like Canada is 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 its own thing. Um, okay, other countries here and there. So, but but we we put a lot of thought into you know what would happen in the world. Um, one of the things that was really useful for this book was we we um, Scott knew a guy who I know know, know now know too, who was an ex CIA agent. Uh, and he says he's retired, but he's clearly not not even close to retired. Like the stuff he talks about and the stuff he knows. Um, but he's been very helpful in kind of letting us think about the way American power is projected in the world, uh, plans, ways America would work. He he initially told when we told him this premise, he's like, "Well, you know, we're actually we're already thinking about doing that." We're like, "What are you talking about?" And he's like, "Yeah, it's 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 this idea called Fortress America is the is the concept that's been sort of war gamed, and the idea is, you know, what would we need if we did want to seal our borders?" What are the things we need to stockpile in the United States? Wow. Stuff that's not present inside the borders, like rare earth minerals and, you know, oil, various things. Like, what would we need to have as much of as possible so that we could kind of continue operating sure. at roughly the same level we have now? So it was, it was fa- like coffee, like crazy things, you know? It was, it was sure. um, <laughs> Yeah, basic things like that that we do take for granted because of international commerce that exactly if we were to really wall up yeah, how do we get this stuff? And, uh, you know, God, I always think of um, that great scene at the end of Three Days of the Condor uh, when Cliff Robertson, the CIA inside man, and, and the, you know, uh, disillusioned agent Redford is talking to him and stuff. And, you know, they talk about the war games and the things they plan out. What if the worst happened and stuff? And it's like, how, what do you think the people are going to think? They're not going to ask us how we get it. We just want to keep our lives, you know, maintaining the status quo that we all enjoy. And how do we do that? And it's like, they're not going to ask us... To, we're not gonna. They're not gonna tell us to ask everybody, please. They just want us to get it, you know, in that yeah. kind of crass uh, Robertson point of view and everything in the movie. And it's like, no, I get it. I think that sounds interesting, and uh, that's that's really cool. And I also think of Meltzer, Brad Meltzer, telling me 
how he got uh, asked by the government to come in and um, kind of figure out anti-terrorist plans and what, yeah. how can we be attacked and things like that. And he was in, you know, think tanks for that to come up with scenarios and A, what could what, what things could be weaponized against us and how could we combat those attacks if they were to happen and stuff. Really interesting, man. Very cool. Yep, absolutely. We um, we went to, Scott and I went to, through the same guy, he introduced us to a thing called DARPA, which is the... Oh, defense, sure. Yeah. Tell, yeah, tell people about DARPA, by all means, man. So DARPA is the Defense Advanced Resource Projects Agency, which is sort of like the it's it's a Defense Department organization uh, whose job it, it's full of geniuses, and their job is to think of things that might hurt the United States down the road twenty, fifty, thirty years, whatever, and then and then invent technology to stop those things before they before they get here. So they have we we sat in a conference room with their all of these experts in all these different fields. So we had somebody whose job it was to design and engineer like undestroyable Jeeps, like things that could not, like that could be hit by five IEDs and just keep going. Um, and they had these incredible tires that like, they were kind of like they were half tank tread, half tire. And they could, they could sort of in a moment's notice, they could flip between tank tread and wheel depending on the terrain you're on. Wow. Um, and, and, and the way that like they had this like active shielding that would just sort of, it, the minute an explosion started to happen, they would slam down so that the, the, it was just everybody was protected. It was wild. Um, we talked to their, like, uh, you know, the person who's fighting epidemics and they, they have this incredible genetic level vaccine that is, or like they're developing genetic vaccines that are, that like, I don't know, like they take, so much less time to produce and they're just super versatile and incredible. We talk to their AI person. We talk to their cybersecurity person. We talk to their, you know, just this, these geniuses who are telling us about all this, all this technology that's out there that they're making now um, in order to defeat the stuff that is going to be out there in 20, 30, 50 years. And this was what was like, there was a name for what it was called. I wrote it down. It was like red, red envelope classification or something. So basically this was the stuff they could, they could tell to random you know, idiot comic book writers. They could tell us these things, um, which meant the stuff they could, and that blew our minds out. You know, you know, all over the all over Washington D.C. and and God knows what they're doing that they can't tell us about. Right, the classified stuff. It's it was it was amazing. It was an amazing day, and so a lot of that stuff is now in undiscovered country, and it's really fun. That's excellent, and that's so. Uh, first issue came out last month. Yeah, first issue came out November November sixth. Yeah. And second one's out in, um, I think, December 12th or something like that. Fantastic. And, uh, it's a monthly book. So we have plans to go for 30 to 50 issues. Um, you know, we're going to see if, if it keeps up. But so far, sales are awesome. Um, and we uh, we also, uh, Scott and I and, and Camo, sold sold the rights to uh, a film, which is amazing. So, hey, that's great. Congratulations. Wonderful. Yep. So it's with New Republic Pictures, who did, like, I don't know, Black Swan and a lot of other inter- interesting oh, movies. Oh, wow. Sure. Yeah. And we, uh, Scott and I are writing the screenplay too. So that's another big job that we're. Wow. Excellent, man. Is this your first screenplay? Um, it's the first one that's, it's not my first screenplay that I've written. It's the first one that is happening at this level. Like the studio specifically hired us to do it is, you know, paying us money and like, and all yeah. that. It's, it's really, um, it's exciting. And, and, you know, the, the, the trickiest thing for it really is, is Scott and Scott and me finding time to, to work together. Because we're both so busy on everything else, and, well, and sure. you know, you know, he lives kind of far out on Long Island. I was, I mean, was going to ask, man, because you guys are both New York guys, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're next door to each other. So go no, ahead. not at all. I mean, you know, right now I'm, I'm in upstate New York uh, in in a town called Beacon, which is um, beautiful, and then I come up here a lot to write, uh, and then I'm I'm in Brooklyn a lot too. Okay, but one of the, like this, like right now, it's probably a three and a half hour drive to get to Scott's house. Wow. And, and from Brooklyn, it's probably you know, it's like a two hour drive. Isn't so, that insane, man? Honestly, again, you'll forgive me, but yeah, I mean, the boroughs are so far apart and everything, and you don't, oh, yeah. you don't, honestly, like being a Chicago guy, where Chicago land, yeah, I mean, it's it really, you know, you include some of the uh, the bigger suburbs and stuff. I mean, it's, you know, maybe you know, a half hour, 40 minutes or something like that, not, you know, two hours away or something like that. Good Lord, that's, for from a Chicago standpoint, that's the middle of the state. That's, you know, halfway to St. <laughs> Louis and everything. So that's amazing. right, right. No, it's it's a trek. I mean, New York is a gigantic state. Yeah. It's really big. Uh, and and I'm, you know, it's it's also the trouble, too, is the city, right? Like, anytime you get anywhere near New York City, it just, like, the, the, the you know, I know Chicago's this way, too. Like, just getting through those highways and dealing with it, like, 
you know, it's just a maze and, and any tiny, there's too many cars and not enough roads and the roads aren't enough. And so anytime any little hiccup happens, whether it's rain or a car accident or any, or a lane closure because of construction, it just, you're, you're, you're screwed. You know, I told you, that's my radio job, man. Now dealing with traffic, Chicago traffic and stuff. That's uh, when I'm not uh, podcasting. That's what (laughs) That's what I'm doing. Yeah, it's, it's a nightmare, right? Like, it's, just any, any little thing blows it all up, right? Well, and it's 24 hours. I mean, that's the other thing is there is no slow time. I mean, I, I do yeah. many an overnight shift. And, yeah, things things happen. Sadly, shootings to just, a, mm-hmm. you know, a semi-jackknifing and losing its load over the expressway and closing down lanes and stuff. So, no, it's a, it's a 24-hour concern. Absolutely, man. Yep, yep. Crazy. No, that's amazing. Well, and I'm glad, hey, honestly, I'm, I'm glad... That you and Scott are working together and everything. Give my best to Scott. I wish he. I gotta bug him to come back on Wordman. It's been far too long since he's been on. Yeah, yeah. So, I, he, um, he's great. He's uh, yeah. He's having a big year too. It's really cool. No, that's terrific, man. That's excellent. Well, I'll, I'll save the Snyder talk when I talk to him. But um, obviously, you've got a lot going on with Star Wars. Yeah, and, and certainly. Um, you know, we're, we're weeks away from episode nine. The Mandalorian is up and running. I have to confess, I've only seen the first episode. I've been too busy to get to episode three yet, but I certainly have. I mean, if you're on social media, you can't help but uh, see Baby Yoda, of course. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of fun. I, you know what's great about it for me, too, is, is uh, you know, it just sort of shows the power of that of that franchise, right? Like, people oh, can yeah. get uh, they can complain about whatever they want to complain about, but when, so, like, it, it pulls people together like nobody's business, and that's, it's, it's really, really fun to be part of it and be involved. Um, even, even, you know, as, a, you know, writing the stuff I'm writing and, you know, I, I, I love baby Yoda just as much as everybody else does. <laughs> well, it opens a lot of questions. Absolutely. And, and really the, the TV show is really great. I haven't watched that behind the scenes thing that talks about the way they're shooting it. Um, which I know is kind of groundbreaking as well from a technical standpoint. Of course, expect that from, Lucas Films and Lucas Arts and everything. It makes sense that they do in an industrial light that they would come up with something new. But uh, yes, we as we get closer to the rise of Skywalker and the end of Kylo Ren's story, potentially the end of Kylo Ren's story, you're doing the rise of Kylo Ren. So you're doing a, yes, a big prequel yeah. series. Um, that's an exciting an exciting story. I mean, I I I was approached by um, Lucas Film to write that story. I want to say like last. I don't know, maybe maybe late spring or something like that. And um, spring of this year or last year? Spring of this year. Okay, go on. And the um, the, the the sort of what happened was was J.J. Abrams, who's obviously directed episode seven, he directed episode nine. Yeah. Um, had this idea for for these characters called the Knights of Ren, who were shown in episode seven. They're in episode nine, but their you know their backstory isn't really told too much in those films. Just yeah. Like and and the other part of the story we don't see too much in the films is kind of kind of how Kylo Ren goes from being Ben Solo, which is obviously his you know who who is his really real name, yes, his first to, name is um, to being Kylo Ren. And so um, JJ was like, I really like that story to be told. I'd like it to be told as a comic. And so went wow. to the, the idea, and then they they reached out to me to write it, which was kind of an amazing thing. So so I got I got a, a very short. Like a like a one pager basically saying you know these are the ideas that JJ had for these characters and and kind of where they came from and and so on um, and and it wasn't much it was very very skeletal and but but it was still it was cool you know it was, it was his his concept of it so so I got to take that and spin it out and turn it into the story that we're going to see in Rise of Kylo Ren which I call um, from Ben to Ren uh, in, you know that's the hashtag. Um, and it's, uh, it's a four-issue miniseries being drawn by Will Sliney, who is an oh, Irish great. artist. Yeah, no, I know. I, Irish dude, he, uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, Declan, he's a Declan Shelby buddy. Yes, he is. He is. He, uh, and Will is amazing. And he and I have known each other forever. That's like great. The earliest days. And, and we've never worked together. And, he, and he's doing the work of his career on this book. It's beautiful. So, um, and what's been fun about it, too, is, like, the fans are dying to see this story. Like, well, I, sure. as a Star Wars fan, I'm dying to see this story. <laughs> How did how did he destroy Luke's temple? Um, you know what what was Luke's temple like? Uh, you know, I, like were there other students? Um, do we get to see Luke doing cool stuff? Like all of the yeah. you know, who are the Knights of Ren? How did Kylo Ren gain control over them? Like all of that stuff. You know, Snoke. Snoke is in the story. So it's okay. basically every 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 sort of button that you might want pushed if you're a fan of these characters and the new trilogy and all that stuff. If you like Luke Skywalker. Um, you didn't get enough of them in the last Jedi. Like all of those things are in this book. So. 
I understand and I agree. Well, no, and there is there is a lot of uh, backstory here that is left untold. So that's terrific. And yeah. yeah, I mean, honestly, you do wonder how did this guy get from from you know A to A to B, or I guess A to C, and we're going to learn about B, I suppose. And, yeah, and also, exactly it. his yeah. fasc- you know, I mean, where did the fascination begin with his grandfather? And, yeah, and then yep. Vader and everything, and that you know, part of the turn and everything. I mean, that's that's the thing. There are there are great, um, you know, I, and and JJ gets shit for the mystery boxes, as people call them, and stuff in his movies. But I think to me, it's like Marcella. If I'm using the phrase correctly, it's like Marcella Wallace's uh, Marcellus Wallace's uh, case. Yeah, the, in, the briefcase. Pulp, yeah. yeah, the briefcase in Pulp Fiction. And you just see it shimmering gold, and you have no idea what's inside of there. Is it his soul? Is it something else? Is it something simple? That's great. When you can, um, when it, when a, story, a, a plot idea suddenly explodes in your brain, and the movie in your mind goes into a bunch of different directions and stuff, that's fantastic. 2001 obviously did that so effectively in that final uh, sequence. Yeah, 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 Star Child, absolutely. Yeah, man, that leads up to the Star Child. Yeah, just even just, you know, getting into the monolith or whatever that void is that Dave is going through. Yes, yeah, and the weird, the hotel room and, like, all the Yes, yes. God, you know, and it's so funny, man, and forgive me, because obviously you're going to answer some of these questions, but that's why I love, (laughs) I kind of love that for, you know, like a decade and a half, you know, you had all these scholarly essays. What can it mean? What can the Star Child mean? And you had all this stuff, and then 2010 comes out, it's like, this means this, this means that, and there you go. Okay. See you later. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. I love 2010. I think it's a fun movie. It's a very, it's a more grounded movie, certainly, than 2001 was. But yeah. I really do appreciate it. I think, frankly, I think it ages quite well uh, 30 years later. So Yeah, I, I, I really liked it as well. I, um, you know, Roy Scheider. Uh, yes. You know, he kind of, like, I'm sure he must have been in bad movies, but but the movies I, I remember know. him being in were all awesome. So. <laughs> I think the only thing, and I gotta be honest, I didn't watch it. Was that Sequest NBC show that he was? Oh, you know, yeah, I guess he was in that, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, he was the commander on that and everything. But no, oh my God, the Seven Ups and so many great movies. He was a truly marathon man. I mean, I, I'm a big Roy Scheider fan, and I thought he was terrific. Lithgow was great in that. Bob Balaban, Helen Mirren as the Russian, she was great. Oh, that's right. I've, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was solid. And I, I, oh, yeah. I read those. The novels, too, like the Arthur C. Clarke books. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Jesus. Oh, no. And I remember when uh, 3000 one came out and they yeah. uh, they unfreeze Frank, poor Frank Poole. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly what they did. You know, it's, I, uh, I just saw a movie last week, Dr. Sleep, if we're talking about Cuba yeah, stuff. Yeah, tell me. Did, how was it? Um, I liked it, but... Um, I'm also like I'm a huge fan of Stephen King stuff, and so it was fun. To, it was I thought it was a great adaptation. But the thing that was interesting was that they made it as it's a sequel to The Shining as a novel, okay. but it's also a sequel to the Kubrick film. Yes, yes. And it was many of the shots and men, much of the design and, oh, yeah. and like many elements of the Kubrick movie, which Stephen King has kind of gone on record as not being a huge fan of because it, it diverged from his novels so much. So. It was interesting to see the two the two versions of The Shining mashed together into this sequel. Um, but I, you know what, I, uh, I I I really liked it. There were some some elements I was not as sure about, but it was it felt very it felt kind of like 2010, right? You got you had okay. this incredibly ambitious, artistic, bizarre kind of very specific vision of its creator, which was The Shining. Sure. And you have Doctor Sleep. Which was super entertaining, really well done. I really enjoyed it, but it was it didn't have that same level of like mystery. Yeah, like like really like like a sort of a visionary kind of you know like someone who was who was going to make it the way he was going to make it, and that was it. Oh, it's and, a, I mean, yeah, The Shining's a fever dream, man. Especially as it gets yeah. more and more intense and everything. Good lord, and it is just crazy, and that's part of its charm and and. and Appeal and everything, absolutely. Isn't it interesting? I, I don't know how Dr. Sleep is uh, tracking, if it's uh, succeeding at the box office or not, um, but isn't it interesting, and, and you're really the first person I've had a chance to talk to about this, uh, the, the failures as far as box office goes yeah. of yep. Terminator and Charlie's Angels and, and all yep. that stuff, and it, it's, it's very interesting because, again, as we're talking about Star Wars, you can understand the stu- you know, studios thinking, Hey, people like uh, established, you know, tropes and uh, concepts, and let's go back and uh, do new versions of X, Y, and Z. And you'd think, oh, this will work. There's an audience for this. These have always done well. 
And all of a sudden, it's like, yeah, maybe not. And, and you know, for whatever reasons. And I, I think I think in the case of The Terminator, I still haven't seen it, but everyone I know who's seen it has loved it, which is yeah. very interesting to me. That I thought I, it was I, good. Oh, there, there you go, Charles. All right, great. Because, yeah, man, and i, I got to be honest, I just haven't had time to go see it. But also, based on the trailers, it sounds like it didn't tell everyone the story in, in enough of a way other than, hey, Lyndon Hamilton's black, Arnold's back, and, and here's explosions and car chases. And it's like, yeah, that's great, but I've seen that a couple times. And I'm not, <laughs> I don't know if yeah, I need no, to rush to see I mean, that I would right say, now. look, it, it, it doesn't tread as much new ground as you would think it could. Okay. And this is like, I guess technically it's like Terminator 6 at this point, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and and I think that they had movies that really did tread new ground. Like if you know, say what you want about like Salvation or Genesis or whatever yeah. those movies, they, they had really shitty moments. But they did try and do stuff that we kind of hadn't seen before. Set right. in the world. Totally. Uh, and this one feels much more like Terminator Two, basically. Okay. In a, good, in a good way or in a, in a, yeah, a retry yeah, way? in a good way. Look, I mean, it, there's a lot of awesome stuff in that movie. Some really sweet sequences and like, and, and Arnold is awesome in it. Little Hamilton is fantastic in it. It is a very entertaining time at the movies. Cool. In my, um, but you know what? I have seen really entertaining Terminator movies. I've seen two of them that are basically the same idea. And <laughs> well, that's the thing a lot of people will say that Judgment Day was a, in a lot of ways, a remake of the first movie with a bigger budget and everything. I, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm as well in the camp loving the first two. I even like three. I even yeah, thought three was too. fine. I do, too. So I, I don't know, man. And I was willing, I still haven't seen Genesis, but I did see four and was like, okay, we're, we're you know, uh, uh, like you said, we're going to a new ground here. Let's, let's you know, see more of the mythos and everything. And it had parts that I liked and parts I didn't like. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, my, my feeling, of, it's rare that I see a movie that I'm like, this was an utter, absolute waste of my time. There's always something that's interesting in, in almost any movie that gets made. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. Before we get back to Star Wars, um, are you watching Watchmen? Yes, I, I actually just, well, I was able to catch the latest episode today, which was which was amazing. Like, the thing, yeah. that, man, I, at this point, I, you know, you may, your mileage may vary, but what the thing that I like the most in storytelling of any um of any in any medium is just novelty and people who are taking risks and doing things that adhere to a vision, their vision, an individual vision, as opposed to something by committee. Like that's the thing that I can just you can just tell when something is is sanitized and made to appeal to ideally the largest possible audience, but all of the sort of blood, sweat, and tears is taken out of it. Um, all of the the individuality, any anything that is you know clearly filtered through one person's experience as opposed to an attempt to appeal to all people's experience. And and I would rather see a single person's vision that kind of fails on some level than see a, you know, solid, effective movie that's kind of, you know, isn't really that revelatory. Um, so that's kind of where I am on stuff, I guess. Well, you know, it's now you say that, and I think of AI, the, the idea that started with Kubrick and ended with Spielberg and everything. Yeah. And that is a really interesting failure. And yes. there's a lot of really, really interesting things going on in the movie. And you can literally, much in a, in a way that it didn't work for me with Justice League, uh, AI, it's like, okay, that's clearly a Kubrick idea. That's clearly, or at least as a viewer, you assume that. And then, then finally you do sometimes read behind the scenes, actually that was a Spielberg idea that I thought was Kubrick, and good for Spielberg to try to emulate Kubrick in that moment or whatever. And it's a, it's a fascinating movie. I really, I think it's a great look at two different visionaries. And, and, and really, I think Spielberg did a great job, at least, you know, give an honest effort to really make something interesting. I do, and, too. And, yeah, interesting failures are much more satisfying than, uh, uh, you know, a, a tepid two-star. Yeah, yeah, that was okay. I mean, I, I find AI almost hard to watch in some ways. Because I can't of, watch it again because of some of the things that are so sad and... and, and yeah, and, that's you it. Know. That's yeah. it. You know, that, that poor little boy... Yes. Or, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's obviously, it's it's a robot, right? It's an, it's an artificial... Oh, yeah, robot. but you, your heart goes out to... I mean, Haley Joel Osment, when he was a little kid, good Lord, man. Yeah. You didn't want yeah. anything bad to happen. Like, and by the way, uh, 
<laughs> As I just talked to Jeff Lemire a couple weeks ago, this is a kid that Jeff Lemire would obviously torture in one of his books. There's yeah. no. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's just a, it's just a. I find it. I found it to be so effective in so many ways, and yet at the same time, it didn't. It's still. I don't know. Like sometimes, like you know, when they talk about horror movies, you know, like horror movies that are, um, like that are too scary, that are legitimately frightening, don't sure. do well. Because they are, that's not the experience of viewer generally. Like a mass viewership does not want to be terrified. They want to go on kind of a roller coaster with tension and release and oh yeah, think they're terrified, but really they're being entertained. The minute filmmakers really go to frightening places, like truly frightening places, the, the box office is cut by 90%. Um, and, and I think in some ways that's what kind of what happened with AI. Like it was asking questions that were real, true questions that people maybe didn't want to think about too deeply. Um, and so it, it went from a realm of entertainment to a realm of, you know, art, I guess. And they don't always have to be different, but there's like a, you know, there's a, a pendulum that swings both directions, you know, art and commerce and so on. And, and I think AI is... Is, is an example of a film that that has this weird kind of like you think it's a like a, you know it's beautifully made and all that you think it's sort of a commercial movie about robots you've seen movies about robots before but then it starts being about all these these horrifying concepts of reality and life and love and you're just like holy shit I you know now I have to answer these questions for myself and what do I think about all this stuff in my life and it's just interesting I love it yeah and I you know uh, Watchmen what I like about uh, Lindelof's uh, Watchmen is it's a different it's a different story that's happening in the Watchmen universe, and yet you've got Laurie and you've got, uh, you know, some of the, for people who aren't, aren't caught up, I'll, I'll leave it oblique, but, you know, you do have you do have characters showing up, obviously. Jeremy Hines, we all know, is Ozymandias and everything, but um, I like that it started in Tulsa, and I like that it started with Regina King's story and Don Johnson's story and what's happening there, and also the ramifications of uh, a, a well-intentioned President Redford and, uh, you know, again, uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And it sounds like a lot of programs aren't working out that you would think, oh, that's a nice idea. That's certainly probably helping people and, and things are going well. No, not, of course not. It's the Watchmen universe. And, it's, yeah. and, and I find that really, really interesting. And I give, I give Lindelof a lot of credit. I mean, really, man, it is tough out there. And um, we'll get back to Star Wars. Don't worry, kids, I promise. But I do think <laughs> it, uh, part of the thing that really does fascinate me right now is this reaction to new people handling these old concepts, what they're doing with them, and this really, you know, vicious fan reaction of, well, that's not the way I would tell that story, times, you know, a million. And it's like, it gets loud and it gets obnoxious, and I don't blame uh, the Game of Thrones guys going, yeah, fuck that, I don't need that with Star Wars, and we're going to make our own shit at Netflix, see you later. And, yeah. and anyone else that, you know, dives into this, frankly, the Star Wars pool, hey, I'm... I'll admit, I am not happy with uh, Star Trek Discovery. I love uh, Captain Pike, and I love what they're doing with him, and I'm very excited about the Picard series. Sure. But uh, I'll be honest, I, I'm not a big fan of Discovery. I'm still watching, and I'm hoping for the best. But uh, right now, after two seasons, I'm still like, yeah, I'm not digging it still. Yeah, it's, it is funny. Like, the, the way that those... The, you know, a PhD thesis could be written about the way that people feel ownership over franchises. I'm sure they have been written. Right I'm sure they, you're right. But, <laughs> have, but you know, it's it, but and 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 the trick of it, and I'm not even sure I know how to do it, is to is to like Watchmen. I think is an is an unadulterated success. I think that maybe there's some people out there who are like rah rah. You know, I'm, I think Alan Moore might be one of them. But like, but sure. basically. That show, I think, is is a success. It's a water cooler discussion show. It's a it seems to be hitting all the bases with kind of the you know the comics crowd, like the people that I talk to, comics creators. Everybody seems to love it, and and I and you know people just dig it. You see it on Twitter, like it's around, and so somehow it managed to avoid all the pitfalls. And you could make arguments as to why, and I think part of it is that it, it really did something radically different using not a lot of Watchmen-y stuff, but enough that you can kind of still, it still has the odor of Watchmen, even if it's not actually Watchmen. Yep. But then again, you know, like, that doesn't seem to work with Star Wars, right? Like, you can't you can't really deviate too far off the path. Um, 
But this, I don't know. Like, I don't know why Watchmen works and, like, say, Solo doesn't. I mean, I could, I could. I like Solo a lot, too. And I, I, and, I did, too, but it didn't land, you know? No, I hear you, man. Well, you know, I, uh, one thing I have, and I think Star, Star Trek shares this as well, is there was so much other material in between the movies, and we've got the Timothy Sahn novels and the Dark Horse uh, comics yeah, yeah, yeah. and the Marvel comics and everything else that's uh, come since. And, and again, um, the the universe has really been built out. So so I do think that it, it is more challenging. And again, the same thing could be said for Star Trek as well. You know, 50 years of, uh, of, of novels and comics and, and fan films and, and things like that. I mean, yeah, it's just... So I do think that us old timers, yeah, we really do have like kind of a set ballpark of yeah, this flies and this doesn't. Um, and I really think you know it's funny. I heard uh, Rob Burnett is a, is a buddy of mine and he's a YouTuber, but he wrote, uh, he directed the movie Free Enterprise and lifelong Star yeah, Trek sure. fan. And he made an observation. And he loves he loves Star Wars too. Um, and now and now all of a sudden I'm blanking on what he said, but essentially it was uh, um, you know uh, oh for Solo. What he didn't, what he found maybe was just the fact that I forget how to say his name, the the lead actor that played on Solo. It's just like it was too early, I think, coming off of watching Harrison Ford die on screen, and it's just like we're not ready for a young Han Solo yet. I mean, you know, Jesus, uh, we had uh, fifteen years between Star Trek Generations and the death of Shatner's Captain Kirk to Chris sure. Pine's Captain Kirk, and again we were going back to day you know one. Um, I, I don't know who you cast as a young Han Solo, and I like uh, that kid. I like I liked him in um, uh, Hail Caesar. The uh, yeah, me too. He was great in Hail Caesar, and and also that uh, Warren Beatty uh, movie about Howard Hughes. I thought he was yep. great in that movie too. So I like the actor a lot. Um, I don't know. I, I and also the idea too that everything we know about Han Solo happened to him in like three weeks. Yeah, that would, <laughs> you know, if there were just that movie could have been great. It, yeah. Like, to this pit that you cannot fall into with franchise and Star Wars, which is you have to give people new stuff. And people, they're so terrified of doing it that it's so frustrating. Like, use the tools, right? Don't betray the characters, but have them do new stuff that, that we haven't necessarily seen before. Like, be unpredictable and, like, yes. take zigzags. And, and sometimes people go crazy about it. Like, you know, you can look at The Last Jedi, which had Luke Skywalker doing a lot of things people thought Luke Skywalker should not do. I don't know. I thought it was pretty great, but whatever. Um, yeah, you know, and but people will react very, very. You know, it's it's tricky. It's really hard to do it. I I think Solo didn't work for. There's 20 things, and and one of them was it was too close to the Last Jedi coming out. Another one was that the um, just as you said, Harrison Ford had just <coughs> <coughs> excuse me had just died on screen. Um, there was a you know too much stuff like too much of his backstory is explained in one movie, um, you know blah 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 yeah. lots of things. And you but, know I give Ron Howard a lot of credit, man, because there's a, again a thankless job, man, coming in and and trying to fix it, much like uh, Joss Whedon with Justice League. Mm-hmm. And, and but in Ron's case, I'm like, I don't know. I thought it was an entertaining movie. I liked Woody Harrelson's character. God, I, and I'm not. A, I have to confess, I'm not a Game of Thrones watcher. So I, I didn't know this love interest uh, that they had in Solo. I know she's got a big part in Game of Thrones. I totally yep. fell in love with her. I mean, I had a bad like movie crush watching her. I'm like, oh, I I, I definitely fall for her. <laughs> yeah, look, there are a lot of elements to it that were great, but there are just enough things that made people be like, nah, whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So and that's it. it. Once that reaction starts to get out there, that's it. It's done. Well, so. much like much like Mandalorian had a lot of mystery about it before it came out, and then just the name, and maybe we saw a couple of images. Now there's Project Luminous. Yes, yes. And, and this is something that, as I understand it, and you will fill in whatever blanks you can, but it's something that's going to, you know, kind of come out on a bunch of different platforms, comics being one of them. Um, what can you tell us about Project Luminous? Um, not, you know, not as much as people seem to want to know, but basically <laughs> it is... It is a, a massive initiative for Star Wars that started to be developed about a year and a half ago um, with a group of writers, and I am I am one of them. There are five of us. The others are Justina Ireland, Claudia Gray, Kevin Scott, and Daniel Jose Older. And all of us have very significant pedigrees as writers within the Star Wars world, our universe, galaxy, whatever you want to say. 
And so we were all brought together to to create this new thing to begin developing. And it's like we were kind of a writer think tank for it. And we got to go to Skywalker Ranch and have the first story session about yeah, it. Yeah, amazing. Which was amazing. I've actually been twice now. Yeah, I was going to say. I know you had been there before, but yeah, go on. Yeah, so so we've gone. The group has gone twice for these uh, these story sessions. The first time we watched A New Hope in George Lucas's personal theater. The second time we watched Empire Strikes Back, and and we're hoping that if we go back, we'll get to watch Return of the Jedi. Um, <laughs> but but it's amazing. You're there with you're there. You know, it's in it's in you know north north of San Francisco in this incredibly beautiful place uh, where you're just thinking and being creative and thinking about Star Wars, and it's just it's just incredible. Um, Really super fun. So we, we've been building this storyline for a long time now, 18 months, I guess. And the we have told, like, almost nothing about it to the world, which is just because we're leaving, you know, we're leaving, we're waiting until the right moment to kind of reveal what it well, is. Well, sure, man. I mean, good Lord. We still got, uh, you know, uh, Last Skywalker. Uh, yeah, yeah, Last Skywalker. That's not even out yet. Skywalker. I'm going to let the dust settle a little bit from some of those exciting things. Sure. And new thing. Um, but in January, uh, it'll fully be announced. There's wow. been like a bunch of seasons and, you know, San Diego Comic Con, New York Comic Con, different things, celebration, Star Wars celebration in Chicago. But, uh, but the, the full reveal will be in January and we'll talk about what it actually is. Uh, as you said, there's, there's cross platform stuff with a bunch of different publishers like Del Rey and Marvel and IDW and then Disney Publishing and so on. So that's, that's kind of what's been released so far. Um, beyond that, I mean, obviously I know, I know all of it. Uh, sure. but I, I can't say. Like, I'm okay. Very paid. Um, but but I will say that it's it's a we're the five of us are all writing a ton. Uh, we're all very busy with it, and it's just it's really exciting to be part of something that is designed to be what we we're talking about before. It's designed to be new. It's not designed to be the same sort of thing you've seen before. And and it's very Star Wars. It's super cool. It's steeped in all of the lore and all the properties and all the stuff we love. But it is it's but it's new. And I think you know if we do our jobs right, it's going to land really really well, which is really exciting. That's terrific, man. No, and I, uh, again, I'm going to make you, before we uh, talk about the final book that's coming up for you and everything, uh, go back through your Star Wars bibliography. I know you did the you did the Vader series, right? And I, and I, well, I know you did the Poe Dameron series. I remember you talking about that. Did you yep. do the Lando miniseries? I did the Lando miniseries. I did um, an Obi-Wan and Anakin uh, miniseries, which yes. was one of the earliest things I did. And then, uh, obviously, Rise of Kylo Ren now. Right. Um, I have I have one more huge Star Wars project which launches in January. Yeah. Which, you know, the Marvel's ongoing Star Wars comic has been running. It launched with Jason Aaron. Yeah. Uh, I think. I, oh, and then John Cassidy, obviously. Way That's back right. John did the art, and no, Jason they did a great job, and I loved a yeah. lot of those arcs and a lot of those uh, standalone uh, single issues. I loved in particular. I remember one issue that Jason did where it, it was Obi Wan, and you really yeah. understood. Uh, uh, Obi Wan and uh, uh, and uh, you know uh, Uncle Owen and yeah. Baru and everything and really like their relationship and that you know Obi Wan trying to kind of nudge Luke into the right way and everything and then start him thinking about you know if not Jedi training certainly just you know making his mind curious with you know uh, mechan- like leaving a box of mechanical things to put together and things like that and Uncle Owen go to him like hey leave the kid alone we don't want him to die or you know end up like his father. Uh, yep. You are a bad influence. Stay the fuck away from our kid. And yep. it was fantastic. It was this great scene that totally resonated and it made sense and it fit. So that was, no, it's a great series. So what can you tell us about the new Star Wars uh, series? Well, so, so Star Wars is, I think it just, the series, the existing series just ended with number 75, I believe. And it's going to relaunch um, with a new number one, uh, which is, you know, Marvel, as we know, has has been known for relaunching their series at, at pretty <laughs> low numbers. You know, the, oh, yeah. 14, you get a new number one. Yeah, yeah. Well, Squirrel Girl. Girl. Squirrel Girl yeah. had like three number ones, I think, within like two years. So, yes, I understand. <laughs> so so here, we, here we have a series that's run for 75 issues. Yeah, um, that's good. That's a good run. And it launched in 2014, so it's very... God damn, long. I didn't realize it had been five years. That's fantastic, man. Yeah. So now we're launching with a new number one um, in January, and the, the sort of the hook of it is that all of the Star Wars comic we've seen so far was set in between A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. Episodes four and five. Uh, and now um, the the Star Wars comic is kind of wrapping up with the Rebels sort of finding their way to Hoth and starting to build a new base there and so on. So now the new comic is set immediately after Empire Strikes Back. So, right. and it's And the whole thing is going to be set between Empire and Jedi. 
So what you get is the story of, among other things, like how Luke goes from being this kind of sad sack, you know, guy with his hand cut off. Yeah, defeated Jedi Jedi that's just kind of a novice Jedi, yeah. Right, Um, and and just found out that Vader's his dad and all these horrible things he has to deal with, to becoming that that guy who walks into Jabba's palace absolutely (laughs) confident and just, you know, just takes care of business. Yep. That's excellent, man. Yeah, there's a good hero's journey. And Leia, of course, I mean, uh, the, unfortunately, the only thing I'm assuming, uh, unless there are some uh, Han and uh, Stasis dream uh, uh, issues uh, possibly coming, uh, if there's a, maybe I'm planning a scene for you, man, as a, as a future story or something. Because that is the only, like, oh, man, Han's going to be, I'm assuming, off screen, obviously. Yeah, I mean, he, he's off screen, but his presence is very felt. I mean, obviously, Han is frozen in carbon at the end of Empire Strikes Back, and he, he doesn't get unfrozen until Jedi. So. Right. Um, you know, I mean, I, you know, I could, who knows, maybe he gets unfrozen and then he gets frozen again, but that would be stupid. I'm not <laughs> no, I was thinking, like I said, I was almost thinking of like, uh, you know, yeah, maybe like while he's, while he's frozen, is he, you know, I, maybe he's, uh, conscious enough to, to be dreaming while frozen or something. Yeah. I mean, there are, <laughs> there are a lot of things that I'm doing with, with the idea of Han. Okay. Running around himself, like Lando's got to obviously be there. Maybe Lando takes the place of Han in terms yeah, of. Yeah, uh, he does. He does in many ways, um, which is tricky for him because he he basically betrayed everybody, and they yeah. know it. They don't like him, and so it's a very it's a delicate balance for him to kind of find his way to to being a hero, like because he's heroic and Jedi, right? So something totally. has to change for him. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, but for like Leia, for example, she has a lot of work to do for the rebellion. Um, she has a duty to them. Like she's, she is a massive inspirational figure for many, many people. And the rebellion is, is at a, a low point, and so she has a lot of work to do in terms of being a leader for them. Absolutely. Uh, what she wants to do is go rescue Han, find him and rescue him. And so she has, she can't do what she wants to do uh, because she has her duty that she she is sworn to uphold. And so it's that's an interesting conflict for her. Chewbacca obviously is like, I have to go find Han. And and he he can't really do it. And and Lando's like, I just want to run away. Uh, and so you know, figuring all that out. And then you obviously you got three PO and R two and all kinds of other characters that are coming in and out. So it's, <laughs> it's it's fun. I mean, there's there's a lot that we're doing that is that is like what we've been talking about this whole conversation, which is a mix of the familiar stuff people want and and new things they didn't know they wanted, and and answering the questions they have in ways that are unexpected and fun. So it's. Uh, I'm really excited about it. The first issue was done. It just went to press. It looks incredible. Actually, I think today is FOC on it. Um, so hopefully retailers will do well and order a lot. Uh, cool. But it's really, um, you know, it's it's just it's just great. It's great storytelling. It's great Star Wars. It's really it's a it's a pleasure to tell these stories and get to you know write Luke Skywalker in a way that I haven't really been able to do. And I don't know. I'm really having a good time with it. Hey man, that's great. And honestly, uh, just like and, and truly, I mean this. Dark Horse had a great run with uh, the Star Wars franchise, and I think we got a lot of interesting uh, stories, and we got a lot of uh, stories of a lot of world building beyond the basics of the core characters and the core concept. And I think Marvel has done an excellent job as well. And uh, you know, really, uh, all the writers and artists are at their top of their game. Who is your artist for Star Wars? Oh, it's Jesus Saiz, who oh, sure. is amazing. He and I worked together on Swamp Thing. Um, back at DC in, in around 2013 to 2015. Cool. Um, but he he also he did you know work on Captain America, Marvel. He's done he's just done a lot of amazing books, and he's he's truly truly skilled, um, and and he's drawing just the absolute hell out of this book. So I I think people once they see the pages and see what we're doing will be very into it. Um, I'm I'm super. I really like him as a as an artist and a person. So it's really fun to be working with him. Dude, uh, that's great, man. No, it's I mean you got a you got a full 2020 coming up and. Uh... Yeah, I, I mean, really. Do. I mean, there's there's all kinds of stuff. It's it's great, you know, writing novels, writing writing uh, comics. I mean, I, I screenplays. Like, I couldn't I couldn't be happier. So it's it's everything. I everything's coming firing on all cylinders. Well, there you go, man. So in the weeks ahead, we're going to be seeing a lot of new Charles Soul stuff, and uh, it starts next week with uh, anyone. Yeah, uh, is that Tuesday or Wednesday that that drops? Yeah, novels come out Tuesday. Comics come out Wednesday. So there the, you go, uh, December third. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And actually, this week, so so by the time this airs, it'll be two days out. Uh, already out for two days is the final issue of Curse Words as well. Hey, so. that's great, man. No, you know, and I knew that that was wrapping up. I thought it already had. So, uh, yeah, you and Ryan Brown wrapping things up with Curse Words. Wonderful. Yeah, which is which has been a, a joy as well. Um, 
you know, he uh, he is off to do Quantum and Woody for a little while for Valiant. Yeah. <laughs> stuff I'm working on, but we <laughs> intend to start our next project uh, in the spring. So we. Oh, wow, that's great! Oh, fantastic, man! I'm glad you guys are getting back together. Two good guys. I'm. Uh, I when when Curse Words was announced, I was really happy for both of you, and you guys did your massive tour, and yeah. uh, that was a great bad shit. You write bad shit, good man. I knew Ryan could write bad shit, but uh, I think you guys did a great job with Curse Words. So that's fantastic that you're wrapping it up. Yeah. The next one ha- like has a has an even crazier premise, than, and almost it, it's so crazy it's going to be hard for us, to, hard for even us to do. Um, but we're excited about the challenge, and we think people will really like it. It's it's a really easy sell if we can do it right. So, well, like it, the hook is great if we can just write it right. And Excellent. Off. So okay, so Curse Words is out now. Also, the first issue of Undiscovered Country from uh, Image, and uh, yeah. issue two coming out December twelfth. And then yep. uh, anyone uh, comes out December 3rd. And uh, after that, man, boom. Rise of Kyle Ren, when's, when's the first issue for that? Uh, it comes out the day before episode uh, episode 9 lands, so that's December 18th. Wow, terrific, man. <clears throat> Great timing. And then Star Wars 1 is out, I believe, either New Year's Day, if that's a Wednesday, something like that, something right around then. Okay, and then, and then we'll get more information in January about uh, Project Luminous. You will. So there's a lot. It's, it's a really, really crazy couple of months, but it's great. That's excellent, man. Well, hey, seriously, no, I, I mean, everyone's excited for what's going on with, with Star Wars right now, and I'm glad you're in the thick of it with these projects. And then also, yeah, congratulations. I'm glad things are going well on the novel front with anyone. And uh, I have full faith in Undiscovered Country with you and Scott uh, at the helm. Uh, it sounds like a great dystopian future and a very interesting mystery, much like uh, the mysteries that you uh, kind of unraveled in Letter 44. And yep. uh, yeah, so no, it's uh, it's a good time to be a Charles Soul fan, and I'm, I'm I'm proud of you. Nice going, man. Well done. Thanks, man. Well, thanks for thanks for letting me kind of talk about it for through this whole thing. It's it's just you know, there's there's a lot going on. My career has really sort of changed this year into a a new place, and it, it feels kind of weird. But I'm I'm excited about it. So I just hope people follow me to the work. If they like stuff I've done in the past, I think you'll like all the new stuff. And I'm just going to keep churning it out. You know, add up, boy. Well, I don't know if uh, I, I hope to see you at a convention soon, and uh, we get to hang out more. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I as this, I hope you have a good Thanksgiving. Is what I'll say now. Even though by the time this airs, we pass Thanksgiving. Oh no, it's still that weekend. It counts absolutely, man. Likewise, man. You best to you and your family. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a really nice holiday. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll usher in uh, the, uh, the the Christmas rush with uh, interesting Star Wars stuff from uh, from Charles Soule. Well done, dude. All right, thanks, man. Take it easy. This is great. Boy, really great to talk to Charles Soule again, and uh, really enjoyed that conversation. And I enjoyed Charles's books, as I'm sure you will too in the uh, weeks and months ahead. And of course, check out Anyone, which is coming out his new novel on December 3rd. Thanks a lot for listening to today's Word Balloon. It was brought to you by Aftershock Comics. Aftershock has been having a hell of a 2020, the year they called the year of reading dangerously. They've been backing it up with uh, some terrific books, whether it's uh, Baby Cakes from Donny Cates, uh, Dark Red from Tim Seeley, Animosity from Marguerite Bennett, Cullen Bunn's Night Temporal, Matthew Clickstein, and You Are Obsolete, a really cool book there. Uh, Garth Ennis Projects, unbelievable stuff, and uh, they're going to continue in 2020 with really neat books as well. And uh, I thank Aftershock for their sponsorship, but uh, also I thank them for the great books that they give us every month. December's going to be another great month for Aftershock. You'll definitely want to be there and check out some of their incredible product. And uh, to find out what to look for, just go to their website. You'll find uh, preview pages, uh, story descriptions, and the diamond codes on how to order these books through your local shop at AftershockComics.com. And Word Balloon brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you, League, for your support via Patreon. If you want to subscribe to Word Balloon, uh, it's free. But if you want to help me out and uh, enjoy what you hear here at Word Balloon every month, go to patreon.com slash Word Balloon or click on the ad, the Patreon ad, on the front page of WordBalloon.com. But thank you greatly, League of Word Balloon listeners. As we wrap up November, I thank you very much. And Thanksgiving weekend, thanks a lot for the support, the listenership, uh, the great emails. I am so happy that people are enjoying what they're hearing here on Word Balloon. December is going to be another fantastic month, and we're going to start off with a bang with uh, Matt Fraction. Matt, uh, we uh, let our patrons at Patreon hear that interview first, but it's a great uh, two-hour conversation with Matt. Uh, Ironically, uh, he talks about his uh, graphic novel, November, that uh, came out at the beginning of November. And uh, shame on me being so busy that I wasn't able to get this out in November. But I'm happy to have it for you the first week of uh, December. Plus, his hilarious Jimmy Olsen. 
Uh, a lot of thoughts on the Superman uh, universe and what's going on there. Of course, uh, Matt and Greg are also uh, writing the Heroes and Villains Superman uh, one-shots that are going to come out in January after the big reveal. I mean, we already know what the reveal is in Superman 18. Uh, Superman ditching the Clark Kent identity. Spoiler! But, uh, you know, it's uh, there's going to be some great stories that uh, Matt, Greg, and Brian are going to give us in those two one-shots. Uh, Superman heroes, Superman villains, as the DC Universe reacts to the big news and what it poss- could possibly mean. But uh, really happy to uh, catch up with Matt and have a nice new fireside chat. So that's on the next Word Balloon. I hope you'll join us for that. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions. Copyright 2019.